45 years ago today, I had a wake-up call. I was heading for disaster, uh, drinking myself to death. I'm not preachy, but uh, I got a message, a little thought that said, do you want to live or die? And I said, I want to live. And suddenly the relief came and my life has been amazing. And uh, I have my off, off days and sometimes little bits of doubt and all that, but all in all, I say, hang in there. Today is the tomorrow you were so worried about yesterday. You young people, don't give up. Just keep in there. Just keep fighting. Be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. And that sustained me through my life. Drinking is one of the few activities that if you don't partake, people assume or accuse you of having a problem. And it's just wild. I think drinkers don't like people who don't drink because it takes the fun out of it for them because there is this idea that's prolific on college campuses if everyone's drunk that somehow like the entire like vibe of the party is going to take on a new flavor and i think that alcohol to me never felt good i never liked it and it was a recipe for a lot of fights a lot of bad stuff happens poor decision making there are so many better ways to have a good time that alcohol isn't necessary. I'll tell you the truth. It depends, right? At the beginning, it's very, very hard. It's 10, okay? You start off because you're in the habit of doing this, whatever it is. And, you know, compulsive behavior, it's like, if you, if you limit alcohol or alcohol and drugs, it's a sort of certain segment of society. If you look at the people that overeat, eat their fucking feelings and end up just as unhealthy, it's a lot more. If you look at people who shop and gamble or have sex or relationships or use the fucking phone, we're, we're very programmed to seek out rewards and get compulsive about it, gamble, whatever. Um, nonetheless, it's fucking hard because you've taught yourself this is the only way to ease my pain. I'm in pain, this is the only way to make it better. Drank in search of happiness and in search of a lifestyle that I thought would bring me to happiness. Um, it didn't, and I woke up one morning going, wow, I've drank a lot, but I'm still not happy. What's that about? Yeah, well, alcohol is an extraordinarily pernicious drug, and yeah. if you're inclined towards it, you can be inclined towards it because you're sensitive to its anxiety-reducing properties, or you can be sensitive to it because it enhances social communication, or because it produces a psychomotor high like cocaine or all of those at yeah. once. And if you're particularly predisposed to alcoholism, you can experience all three at once. For people like me who are, who are in recovery, you are born feeling empty on a certain level. And you are looking unconsciously or consciously to fill that. As, tre <laughs> As family trees go, Every leaf on my mom's family tree uh, is, I think I can pretty safely say uh, everyone, except for my generation, like my cousins, is, has, uh, I don't even think dead or dying even counts anymore. I think they're all dead. I think they all died from alcoholism. Alcohol is often used as a sleep aid for people who are struggling with sleep when things like over-the-counter remedies or herbal remedies have just not worked out for them. And alcohol, unfortunately, is anything but a sleep aid. But alcohol is quite different in that regard because it's a sedative. What it's really doing is trying to essentially knock out your cortex. It's sedating your cortex. And sedation is not sleep. But when we have a couple of drinks in the evening, when we have a couple of nightcaps, we mistake sedation for sleep. In truth, what's happening is that you're losing consciousness quicker, but you're not necessarily falling naturalistically asleep any quicker. The second thing with alcohol is that it fragments your sleep. Alcohol will actually have you waking up many more times throughout the night, so your sleep is far less continuous. Now, some of those awakenings will be of conscious recollection the next day. You'll just remember waking up. Many of them won't be. Your sleep will be littered with these sort of punctured awakenings throughout the night. And again, when you wake up the next morning, you don't feel restored by your sleep. Like many Brits had had a very, very boozy December. Christmas time, I was on vacation, I was drinking a lot. And I've always been able to drink a lot. I think I get my genes from my mum's side in that thing, like I can, I can drink. I would look back and recognise that I would go to events for, for work and be like, I can't enjoy myself until I've had a few beers. And I just felt so much pressure. And this is one of the things why I've sort of distanced myself from the rugby community, because so much of it is about how much can you drink? Let's get you as drunk as possible. 
I would drink and drink and drink and drink and then you would just reach that moment where you're like, wow, I shouldn't have had that last beer. And you yeah. wake up the next day and you have a terrible headache and you're suffering. I, I bought one of those rings that will tell you about your sleep. Yeah, aura ring. Yeah, and it was yeah, amazing because I couldn't yeah. sleep. I was like, why can't I sleep? I'm working 14 hours a day. I'm doing two hours in the gym. I'm eating really healthily and I can't sleep. What's wrong with me? I bought this ring and it was booze. Like to truly be powerless over something is fucking demoralizing. It's so rough. And yeah, that was one of those things where it's kind of a source of shame for me. And then I see his reaction to that and that he, that's a source of optimism for him. It like infected me where I was like, oh yeah, good on you. You, you did, you kept at it. You didn't die from this. And a lot of us do, you know? Cause I think there's a, there's a couple of common fallacies about sobriety. One of them being that people hit a bottom and then that's that. And most addicts have many bottoms. I mean, I had many, many, I mean, I have many events that were even worse than the one that ended up being my last event, you know? If you don't think you're addicted, and I'm talking about anyone, from the highest to the lowest, if you don't think you're addicted, then see if you could turn it off for a week. Got quiet in here, didn't it? <laughs> didn't it get real quiet? It's a progressive disease, so it gets worse and worse as you get older. So I didn't, you'd think I would have a drink the very next night but I didn't and then you know as I was like 18 19 20 then it really started to kick in I was drinking every night it was a secret I would drink with my pals I would race to a liquor store at quarter to two so I could have alcohol at my house and drink more than I did with my friends and um, it just became this roller coaster ride that I didn't understand remember there are people who have genetic variants that meaning genes that they inherited from their parents that make it more likely that they will become alcoholics. If people are ingesting alcohol, even if it's not every night, there are well-recognized changes in neural circuits. There are well-recognized changes in neurochemistry within the brain, and there are well-recognized changes in the brain-to-body stress system. Increased stress when people are not drinking, diminished mood and feelings of well-being when people are not drinking, and as you'll soon learn, changes in the neural circuitry cause people to want to drink even more in order to get just back to baseline or the place that they were in terms of their stress modulation and in terms of their feelings of mood before they ever started drinking in the first place. Those sorts of drinking patterns are changing neural circuitry and they're changing hormone circuitry. They're actually changing them for the worse. And worse is defined as making people less resilient to stress, higher levels of baseline stress, and lower mood overall. You do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself, you, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah, well it is, but you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like, that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do yeah. and, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. Actually, the addiction is the substitute for that, if, if truth be known. When I was a teenager, I was, I was addicted to alcohol and um, got in a lot of trouble and got sober when I was 17. And, um, and then three years after that, I was on a, a television show and that felt great. And it was like this new thing, a new source of, you know, to fill me up. Like when I was young, it was like, I was just shy. I just didn't know how to get along in the world. I didn't know how to talk to people. And alcohol was like the best solution for that. The problem is for me, you know, normally you have a window. It's like, it's fun. They say and then fun with problems and then just problems. Like my window from fun to just problems was so short. And I, you know, I was a ward of the court and, and all this stuff. But um, once I couldn't use alcohol to sort of fill that hole, it was like, oh, success, attention, this is great. And so in a weird way, I got addicted to validation, I guess, or success or whatever that but is. But there is like an awareness that I really struggled with particularly in my like late teens when I was like when I was going out to places for the first time where you would you would like feel and it, again it could have largely been in my head but you would feel watched when you went into a bar when you went into a pub and then you know in my case the quickest way of 
forgetting about the fact that you're being watched was to get very drunk. Um, and then as you get very drunk, you become aware that, oh, people are watching more now because now I'm getting very drunk. So I should probably drink more to ignore that more. And like, you know, so it gets into, you know, you get into it, 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 can, it can, like it can affect your, Psyche, and you sort of have to, uh, yeah. And I think it's that's something. As I said, yeah, there has there is no blueprint for starting young and working stuff. Very out. hard to moderate, but mo moderation is the key. I think. But I think things like sugar, sweet stuff, junk food, cocaine, alcohol. It's all things that like it feels good. The more you do, but it's like it, it's the worst thing for you. I think hangover is a constellation of effects ranging from headache to nausea to what's sometimes called anxiety, which is anxiety that follows a day of drinking. Anxiety, I think we can understand physiologically if we think about that process of alcohol intake, increasing the amount of cortisol and the ratio of cortisol to some other stress hormones. That well explains why some people wake up the day after, or even the day, the day after a night drinking and feel anxious and not well and stressed for reasons they don't understand. I've been through, I got sober uh, when I was younger, when I went uh, when I, in 2001, uh, which I now look at it as a sort of a JV version of what really the problem is. I was sober for a couple of years and then I thought, you know, I wanna just drink like a normal person and I wanna have wine at dinner and so on. And I, I and you know, I was able to. I was able to for about eight years. I started to drink more and more and more, and it was really hard for me to accept that that meant I was an alcoholic. I was like, I can just go back. I was fine before. You know, I just need to take a break. I just need to slow down. I just need to, I, I'm okay. You know what I mean? This isn't me. And I come home from work and I start to drink and I just sit there and drink till I pass out you, on the couch. No one can get sober for their jobs, for their wife, for their kids. They can't do it for any of that. They can only do it when they decide they're done. My big worry when I got sober was I wasn't gonna have fun anymore. You know, as an alcoholic, I talk about, you know, some warning signs, you know, like DUIs in a cul-de-sac, things like that. The idea of, you know, have you been through it to talk about it and see, like, you know, this is what you go through, heart surgery, you know, alcoholism. I went to rehab in wine country just to keep my options open. And the idea of, you know, these are the things you got to talk about. There's this thing for alcoholics called a blackout, which isn't really a blackout. It's more like sleepwalking with activities. And I believe it's your conscience going into a witness protection program going, you're about to have sex with a hobbit. I've got to go now. Good luck. I'm checking out. I'm leaving the body on, but we're not going to remember anything. Good luck to you. Take care. You Getting into it? No. Was I remember it a gradual that, thing? Or? Yeah, it was very gradual. It was just, and you're off, you know, oh, yes, you're yes, off yes. and running. And then the alcohol kicked in and decided, and then eventually you realized, I can't, I remember stopping it on my own because I was about to have a son. And I didn't want to be coked up going, hey, dad loves you. Here's a little switch. I'm going to throw up on you. You know, you don't want to be like that. And I had to kind of go, but I did it alone. So that was why it was, you know, 20 years without any help. More importantly, my son. I think that was the beginning of kind of, you know, thinking outside the box of, you've got a responsibility. And it's you know, what I, what I realized was I was, I was running to things to avoid, to avoid tough feelings, painful feelings. Um, I just didn't know how to deal with them. And looking for anything I found that I, I, I use for escape, to escape um, um, those kinds of, um, uh, I guess, difficult feelings. I don't know how better to describe it. I mean, that can be anything. That can be drugs, booze. Netflix, <laughs> you know, snacks, um, anything. I don't want to be, I don't want to, at this point, to be running from anything. I want to be, I want to sit in it, I want to feel it, I want to get through the rough night. And I found um, in doing so, you just, you come out the other side with a, with a, a more profound understanding of yourself, a, a greater gratefulness for um, those in your life, um, and the birds and the trees and everything else. I haven't had a drink for a long time now, but for the first 10 years of that period, a, a lot of my thinking and behavior didn't really change. It was, it was a slow involvement, really. It was only then and after I'd had my children, my, my daughter and my son, 
I began to realize, and it's actually clear in the film, you can, and I can see it in, in a form of desperation that here I am suddenly faced with responsibility and that I had to do something about it. So. Really? Yeah, yeah, like a real desire to live. And I suppose the birth of my first son, James, was a moment in my life where I got to realize fully that I wasn't just living for myself, this little baby who didn't need a best friend. Uh, who needed a dad, so that was a big turning point. It's interesting, I, I, I didn't one day wake up and say, I'm giving up drinking. I have done in the past, like, I've had periods of my life where I'd given up drinking and then gone back to drinking. Um, but this time, I don't know, it was just different. I really worked to sort of change my mindset. I really asked myself, like, why do you drink? Why are you drinking? And a lot of the time my answer would be to feel more comfortable in the social environment. Yeah. And I just put myself in those environments and just would force myself to be there. I'd force myself to hang out and, and go to a club or go to a bar, or go to a dinner because I didn't feel like I could go and not have a drink because mm -hmm. of the stress of it. But then after a while, I sort of was like, mate, you've got to pull your socks up here and you can't just live in your house all the time. You've got to go out and enjoy yourself. And, and if you're only enjoying yourself because you're drinking, then you really do have a problem. I had a great support system. Jack is one of my best mates and we travel all over the world. He doesn't drink and doing it with him was, was a really helpful experience for me. My brother is always on the road with me. He was very supportive. And yeah, I just really set my mind yeah. to it. I was like, I really want to do this. I want to prove to myself I can do Alcohol's it. Alcohol is a really bad drug, you know. 50% of murders take place in an alcohol-fueled environment, either the victim or the perpetrator or both is drunk. It's it's almost the sole cause of domestic abuse. It's almost yeah. the sole cause of so-called date rape. If you dig into criminal behavior deeply enough, well, hell, you don't have to dig much at all before you find alcohol. It's also the only drug we know that actually makes people more aggressive. I, I, I gave it up for a long period of time. You know, the insanity of having another drink a couple of years later and starting this whole thing all over again um, was insane. I was insane. I am insane. But interestingly enough, only in this area. Like, I'm a pretty logical fellow in every area but this one. A period of, of, of four years where I needed to quit drinking, and the drinking was uh, got in the way. And I talk about that a lot in the book. Uh, that was one of those obstacles that I had to, to, to get over. And I think that, you know, once again, uh, I needed to clear the road in order for these, these things to happen. So it really is an inside job. And, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to clean up my act and, and um, figure that whole so situation out. you no longer out. drink? No, it's been uh, over 11 years. It, it had a lot to do with uh, the extent to which I was in the grips of addiction and alcoholism. Um, and I think a, a component of that is that I somehow felt defective. You know, there was a, a, just a, a discomfort in my own skin, which is um, a, a common trait of alcoholism. So I just felt like there was something wrong with me. Not being present and not being able to, to do the things that I needed to do as a husband and a father. Um, I mean, I was functional but uh, barely hit some. Three daughters, a 26-year-old, a 25-year-old, and almost 22-year-old. And so you start looking at their lives and you start looking about, thinking about when you're gone, what are they gonna remember about you? And what are they gonna think, you know? And so those, those things start creeping into your mind. It makes everybody stupid and fuzzy-minded. And, you know, the problem is, is when you're drinking, you think you're cool, but, you know, you have those same delusions that, that Homer Simpson's friend, Barney, had when he was drinking that you're this kind of, you know, elegant and, and sophisticated comedian. And I am a recovering alcoholic. And to you out there, I know there are people struggling in this day and age of counsel and hatred and non-compromise, children being bullied. I say to this, be kind to yourself, be kind, stay out of the circle of toxicity with people. If they offend you, live your life. Be proud of your life. 47 years ago, I was in a desperate situation, in despair, and uh, probably not long to live. And I just happened to acknowledge one day that there was something really wrong with me. But I didn't realize that it was a kind of condition, mental, physical, emotional condition called alcoholism or addiction. I'm not an expert on drugs. I'm not an expert on anything. I know nothing, except I have found a life and no one bullies me. I want to say to all you young people who are being bullied, take heed. You be 
proud of yourself. Don't listen to them. When I think about my favorite rock stars, I think of a life of rock and roll with drugs and alcohol. Singers often say they feel pressurized to party hard and to drink. In this video, famous singers will be sharing their battles with alcohol and ultimately what motivated them to quit drinking. So tired of depending on it. I think I finally just got a point of just saying, I, I just don't want it anymore. After years of drinking, Alice Cooper finally kicked his addiction in September of 1983. I didn't know that alcohol was that strong. I thought it was very social, and I thought I had total control of it. It, it gets you before, gets you before you know your head. How hard was it for you to get sober? Fear was a big motivator in that for me, you know? Losing my family, that was the thing that scared me so much. That was the bottom I hit, that my family's gonna go away because of my behaviors that I brought home from the road. I got kicked out of the house by my wife. I was living on my own somewhere, and I, I did not want that. And maybe as part of my upbringing, my family kind of disintegrated when I was a kid. You know, father left, mother passed away, I had to live with my brother. So, and she said, hey, you're not just going to the therapist now. You're just not just talking about this. You gotta go somewhere and sort this shit out. So that's what I did. So rehab did, rehab really worked for me. I'd fall off and things go too far and I get kind of crazy and there's this other guy, Pat Mike, <laughs> who takes over at a certain point. Everybody has an alter ego when they drink, or not everybody does, but I do. And that dude gets me into trouble. <laughs> Meditation helps when you actually take the time out for self-care and you count your breaths and you go throughout your day. I notice days that I don't meditate, I have bad days, you know. If I just take 10 minutes out of my day to count my breaths and not think about anything else and clear my head and then go throughout my day, my day goes a lot better. And I don't smoke anymore and I'm sober. Uh, How long have you been sober But for? I, I've been sober since the pretty much the vocal surgery kind of did it for me um, because I just learned so much about the effects, which again, you're just not taught. Um, it's not really the drinking, it's staying up all night. You know, once you have your drink, you end up smoking. And I kind of, I, I have a... I've become the face of a lot of things kind of against my will, I guess, from my opinions, when you're someone in my position, your opinion becomes your identity. And mm. it also becomes kind of almost like a you kind of become this like preacher or you become this, you know, they don't really let you just always have your own opinion. So I've decided to start telling people I live my own lifestyle. Alcohol was never my problem. There was other things that I end up, you know. I like to go up. My partying thing was really a matter of killing time in between gigs. So I wasn't really using when I was on the road, I wasn't really using when I was in the studio. I was always focused on music. So when I got sober, all that sort of effort that I put into, you know, would it turn into a massive addiction at that point. Um, I t took all that and just put it straight back into the music and it wasn't really reliant on me being buzzed or or should I say inebriated to be able to create stuff? Sober, yeah, sober. Right really? Now. Yeah. How long? Uh, 15 days. 15 days, all right. 15 days, more than before. <laughs> it was my New Year's resolution. I just, you know, I like I said, and praise the Lord. So How does that it, feel? How do you feel? I'm 30 years old now, so it's like, damn. Like, I'll be out of it, and Like, our priorities I've seen you don't like matter. I've seen you I like know that. you have, but back then. <laughs> It didn't matter when you, you only like 24, 25. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got to chill a little bit. But, you know, that's just for now. You know, I'm not forever. It's just, some, you know, getting my SHIT together. Most people probably don't relate um, Linkin Park or myself with, you know, alcoholism or drug addiction or anything like that. And, uh, um, you know, but that's, that's a part of my life, and that's been a part of my life since I was a very young 
boy. I started using drugs when I was 11. So it was, I don't, you know, I definitely wasn't making records at that time. Um, you know, and uh, um, so I was, uh, I was exposed to it really, really young. And there was a lot of things that happened to me uh, as a young person that were really difficult to deal with. Um, and uh, and uh, I found myself alone a lot. And so um, also, and so it was, I think that uh, given the nature of a lot of the aspects of my childhood, the, when that first person offered me you know, an escape from reality. Um, I kind of took it and I ran with it. You know, um, the one I would say that music has probably kept me alive uh, more so than anything else. I mean, um, other than you know, uh, love from your friends and family, I think that uh, you know, music is probably the reason why I still am here because that is how I get out a lot of the stuff that's going on inside of me, and, and that's how I kind of work through a lot of things, I reflect on my life, I reflect on how I feel, and I get to talk about it. So what do you think the deep wound from the past, mm -hmm. from you as a little girl growing up, you're trying to heal as you reach for your relationships as an adult woman? My dad's absolute lack of presence and effort with me. But you know, as I got older, I definitely understood that it was the alcohol. It wasn't a choice that he was necessarily making in himself that he didn't want to. But when you're step little, me. You when don't you're know little, that. you don't know. Especially when he's like, "I'm drinking juice." Yes. So I'm like, "Oh, well, I'll drink juice." Like, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know the sort of effects of it. But yeah, like when someone that you love so much, and the more that you feel like they don't love you, you love them even more. Mm -hmm. Like I was definitely always trying to fill that void. You know, I was sober for five years and then I thought that I could kind of go back and be like a, you know, just a normal drinker again or something like something. Right. And I think I was for a little bit and then it just escalated. And it just got to a point where I was, you know, physically and mentally just drained and um i just felt terrible i got tired of i got tired of feeling tired as they say not even a glass of wine or no anything? it would kill me if i what started you mean again. It would kill me? i'm an alcoholic so it was uh, it would be a uh, kiss of death for me to start drinking again my relationships with my friends my family everybody around me are so good and have been for so many years now i wouldn't do anything to destroy that again you know, it's very hard to have relationships when you're doing drinking. I, for me personally, anyway, um, and uh, you become closed off, unreceptive, insensitive, all the dreadful things that you've heard every other pop singer ever say. And uh, I was very lucky that I found my way out of that. Um, it's it's been good for me. I, oh, I quit drinking. I always tend to bring up drinking whenever I talk about my life because it's such a huge, long, important part of it. Important part of it. When I quit drinking almost seven years ago. It was like, I, I was still creative while I was drinking, but it was like there was a damp filter on it, you know? And when I got sober, it's like, that was ripped away. So my mind is on overdrive all the time, yeah. you know? I'm writing, I'm shooting photos, I'm making music. As long as I'm just moving forward and creating things that I think have artistic merit, I'm generally a pretty happy guy. So if I tell you anything, I had my first drink when I was five years old and it was just all fucked up from there. Everybody hits me now. 
You're force fed an idea that it's only cool if you're fucked up. It's not. It's actually better once you get your head together. Survivor. I've been, you know, I've survived a lot of things. Um, life is full of, you know, pitfalls. Um, even when you're sober. What I couldn't do when I was an addict was c communicate. Except when I was on cocaine, I thought I could because you talk rubbish. If you don't communicate and you don't talk about things, then you're never going to find a solution. In any opportunity that I think any of us have a chance to speak out and say, if, you, if you're having a struggle, if you're having any difficulty, there's always somebody to reach out to and to, uh, to talk to. Being sober for me has hopefully made me a stronger person. You know, to be able to deal with things in life that before I would reach for a drink to try and help me solve, now I have to find my own inner strength through sobriety to, to make it happen. But it's a good feeling, feeling good. Listen, Thank I have you. the most amazing last night of my life drinking story. It was Drake's 30th birthday party and I made a, quite a fool of myself. Really? Oh, and, I, and it took me weeks to stop doing this every morning I woke up. And, uh, and then I had a conversation with myself. I looked out the window and I went, okay, John, what percentage of your potential would you like to have? Because if you say you'd like 60 and you'd like to spend the other 40% having fun, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But but what what percentage? There's no wrong answer. What is it? And I went, 100. I want it, I want it all. I said 100. I want it all. And, and I, then yeah. the voice in my head said, okay, do you know what that means? And I went, we don't have to talk anymore. I get it. And so what happens when you stop drinking? The level goes it feels like boredom at first but if you stick with it the line goes the line straightens out and it goes kind of low right you're like oh i'm not having these high highs but if you work you can bring the whole line up wow do you know what i mean what did getting out of hand look like through a long time where i was just out of hand you were yeah. drinking. I was drinking too much. Well, well you were playing, among other things. You, you were know? playing like, I mean, you were like a, a college athlete and you were, you know, you were uh, uh, playing bars and stuff like that. There's a lot of booze around. You a know? lot of booze around. Yeah. yeah. When, you know, starting out in college, is, is not <laughs> floating kegs is not a good, <laughs> yeah. good way to start your life out. But <laughs> some people overcome it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, then, you know, playing bars and then all of a sudden moving to Nashville and, and we're, we're traveling all over the country in a U-Haul van. I'm in a U-Haul in a van and playing these small bars and clubs six, seven nights a week, you know, playing four or five hours a night. And it, you know, it, it turns into a crutch after a while. And um, it got out of hand for a long time until my wife finally put her foot down and said that, uh, you know, it's time to stop. And uh, I did, I, I uh, sort of went cold turkey and dropped everything for about 10 years. The level Do you miss goes, being it not feels sober? like boredom at first. Sometimes, sometimes. But if you stick yeah. with it. Yeah, I, I um, I miss what's the pros and cons that that if I do I'll wind up doing too much for sure for sure I can't control it it's just the way you are just the way I am and I don't want to I don't want to push it again because when I get that way my kids don't talk to me I get a divorce <laughs> I, I'm thrown out right. of my own band right right uh, what else I lose everything I mean that's happened enough times for me to finally realize, you know what, it's not worth it. Right. When you get sober, if you don't, if you don't ha continue your aftercare by going to a, a couple of meetings every now and then, mm -hmm. you're going to wind up using again. I am. I feel like I'm 30 because I haven't had a drink in 30 years. Right. Now, when I was 30, I felt like I was 63. You know, <laughs> and it, it really is going backwards. Right. Because I, we we do five shows a week. You know, an hour and a half, all out. Alice Cooper, and I feel great. You know, all my friends. When I first went to Los Angeles, the first people I met was Jim Morrison, uh, Jimi Hendrix, yeah. Keith Moon. Yeah. These were all my big brothers. Didn't play well, did it for them? I, I kept watching them just drop off. You know, and I realized at that point when I finally did get sober that you have to separate your character from your real life. You know, I came from that generation of live fast, die young, and have a good looking corpse, yeah. you know? Um, but when it, it starts getting too real, all of a sudden you get to that point. And I think everybody from Ozzy to Steven Tyler to everybody that's my age and still going yeah. had that crossroads where they get to that point and go, okay, I'm either gonna die or live. There are numerous ways to solve that problem. There the one, another way is find out who you are, join a group of people that are trying to do the same thing as you connect to a higher purpose. That's a better way of living than 
dependency on substances or behaviors it's just unfortunately harder <laughs> yeah at first although but like in the end addiction is harder you know I mean? yeah, it, so yeah, it seems effort. easier at the start and then it there's then it's like there's a bit like i tell people that are still using it's better than what you're doing now yeah. Yeah, otherwise i'll be using with you i'll be using with you yeah. it's better than that because like in the end it don't work anyway you're still in the pain you're still in the misery things are getting worse you're ashamed of yourself and f- you're hurting people that you love and you think yeah. that you're worthless all of that can all be remedied it's hard but what else are you going to do with your life some pitiful trudge to the grave without meaning what this is it this is oh. it you know it's, it's a, like a wake-up call in a way i'm very grateful lucky to be an addict because now i've got no choice i've got no choice for me it's either oh. you know that pitiful life or become awake to anyone out there who's struggling with their alcohol habits please know that you're not alone there is a solution if you're willing to take that first step and get support Keep trying, keep fighting, and never lose hope that freedom and a better life are possible. I want to thank these celebrities for opening up and helping to remove the stigma around alcohol. When we share our stories openly, we take away the taboo and the shame and stigma. If you've been trying to quit drinking and you just can't get it to stick, follow me over on Instagram and jump into my DMs or have a look at all of the free resources I have available in the description below. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? When I look in the mirror, I see a loser. (laughs) A loser trying to convince himself he's a winner. Because that's what everybody's been telling me my whole life. I'm somebody. But I ain't. I'm nobody, man. 85% of adults have drank alcohol in their life. It's an extremely popular drug that decreases specific neuronal excitation in your brain with biological byproducts that have a huge impact on your body. So if you're wanting to partake in a bevy, short for beverage, is there an ideal time for your physiology? Is it better to day drink or drink at night? When you drink a shot of vodka, 20% of the alcohol is absorbed by the stomach, 80% in the small intestine, where it goes into your bloodstream, then to your liver to be metabolized. Ethanol gets into cells by passive diffusion, so the more you drink, the faster you get drunk. And when alcohol accumulates and finally gets to your brain, it suppresses the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, which causes information transfer in the brain to become slower with only the largest signals making it through. You feel less, perceive less, notice less, and remember less. If you're a drinker, we hate to be the ones to break some sobering news to you, but a major new study says no amount of alcohol is good for your overall health, not even that cheeky glass of red wine you might be holding as we speak. Alcohol is holding you back, and that's it. It's simple, right? If you are regularly consuming alcohol, it is holding you back. Even if you're only very periodically consuming it, it's holding you back. There is no positive physiological benefit whatsoever no. that comes from drinking. Yeah, and, and let's, let's talk about that specifically, right? We don't, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that message, you know, oh, this my trainers give me cancer, right? You know, everything's, every, all the health issue. But the, the facts are absolutely there. It's 100% poison, it's neurotoxic, it's terrible for our brains, it's terrible for our bodies. There are no physiological benefits at all whatsoever to drinking alcohol. The overall risk of liquor outweighs any known benefit. It says alcohol accounted for nearly one in 10 deaths in people between the ages of 15 and 49. That data was recorded in 2016. Across all age groups, alcohol was associated with 2.8 million deaths. As you grow up, you start to do different sorts of events. You'll go for dinner more, you'll go to quieter venues, you'll go to somewhere where there's live music where you can have a conversation. And that is, that sort of enjoyment is facilitated more by being sober. So I wonder whether it's a byproduct of of the kind of events that young people typically attend. I, I think that's as well, when you're in an environment where everybody else is drunk, like that is, that's full on. When you're sober and you're just looking at people, yeah, ugh, it's, it's heavy. I feel like if I'm in an environment where everybody's drunk, I almost need to be drunk just to deal with it, tolerate it. Let's say you're 35 now and you don't change your job. Well, you'll be 40 so fast you can't even believe it. It'll just happen. Like it'll take five years, but it happens. It happens overnight at this, in the same way. And if you haven't changed, then you'll be the same except worse. So that's the alternative. If you don't find what you're doing sufficiently productive or responsible or meaningful or engaging or all of that, it's like, well, there's a big risk in changing it. It's like, yeah, there is. When you hear the term a functional alcoholic, or you, like you almost, you almost want to blame them and say it's a, it's a, well, you just have this distorted view of what's functional, right? But what I'm hearing is that 
it's not really distorted. They're legitimately feeling functional because A, they may have started with metabolic dysfunction, but they've just created so much more metabolic dysfunction that practically the only way they feel semi-normal is by functioning with alcohol. Yes. That's very scary. That's the trap. And then, I mean, when you hear someone, you hear the terms thrown around like, oh, he pickled himself with alcohol. He pickled, and I used to think like, oh, when someone pickles themselves by, you know, like see the, 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 the crusty old guy that's just like kind of talking crazy because, oh, he pickled himself, right? You know, I used to think, oh, the cirrhosis, he just, he pickled his organs. It almost seems as though, like, no, 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 pickled cellular function. And that's why you have all this just multiple levels of deterioration that seem to happen. We have an amazing family, except for the fact that my husband is an alcoholic and an addict. It is 8.36 in the morning in the AMs. I bought this 12 pack at 7.05 probably. And this is my third beer. Well, out of the 12 pack I've had, I think it's my fifth beer of the day. For many years, it's been known that high levels of alcohol consumption, so 12 to 24 drinks per week or more, is certainly causing neurodegeneration, in particular of the so-called neocortex, the outer layers of the brain that house associative memories, that house our ability to think and plan, that house our ability to regulate our more primitive drives according to context, etc. To make very clear, drinking a lot, so having you know three or four drinks per night every night of the week is clearly bad for the brain. Hangover is a constellation of effects ranging from headache to nausea to what's sometimes called anxiety, which is anxiety that follows a day of drinking. Anxiety, I think we can understand physiologically if we think about that process of alcohol intake increasing the amount of cortisol and the ratio of cortisol to some other stress hormones. That well explains why some people wake up the day after or even the day the day after a night drinking and feel anxious and not well and stressed for reasons they don't understand. Does alcohol impact metabolism? The other huge whammy, unfortunately, is that alcohol also gets converted into a molecule called acetaldehyde, which is toxic to mitochondria and cells. And that's its primary source of toxicity. And so when people, if people drink a massive amount and they die of alcohol poisoning, what, what, what's actually happening is that acid aldehyde levels are rising and they are poisoning the mitochondria in their cells and that can cause death. If you do it at a lesser level and just have a few drinks every day, but you're chronically drinking or you binge drink a few times a week, you know, go out with the guys and oh, you know, party and end up having 10 drinks, you're actually damaging the mitochondria in your cells. And if you do that over time, you're actually making the brain metabolic impairment worse. So you're actually making brain metabolism worse over time. And then that fuels your need for the acetate from the alcohol to fuel your brain cells. And now you're screwed because yeah. you're, you're using the alcohol as a treatment to feel better, and yet it's causing more and more harm and damage. If you really are an alcoholic and you find your way into 12-step, there is the initial phase of detoxifying your body, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and perhaps the Trojan horse there is people come in, they're just like, I just wanna learn how to stop drinking. Um, what they don't realize and what comes later is this notion that putting the bottle down is really just the beginning of trying to figure out a way to be emotionally sober because when you no longer have that coping mechanism, all of the uncomfortable emotions flare up and you're, and you're, and you're left with no tools for how to manage them because Complete. the way that you have done it historically has been taken away. So in the case of the people that you have worked with, given that you know perhaps they're not alcoholics, on some level, everybody is self-medicating with alcohol. When you go to a restaurant, the first thing they do is put bread on the table and ask if you want alcohol because both of them drop your frontal lobes. Both of them make it more likely you're gonna order more and spend more money at the restaurant. So the bread is an 
investment on their part because bread gives you a sugar spike, a blood sugar spike, which then pushes serotonin in your brain and makes you happy. But serotonin drops frontal lobe function. One thing they never tell you when they give you an SSRI for depression is, oh, you're gonna become a little bit more impulsive because it's gonna drop your frontal lobes. And then alcohol, which also drops your frontal lobes. So you'll drop more cash in the restaurant. You know, so many athletes, particularly even like endurance athletes are notorious for, you know, they, they drink a lot of calories, they, they really do. And it's a lot of athletes in general just drink alcohol. And I just think about the metabolic impairment that happens as a result of that, that they may not even be aware of, especially as they get into their 30s and their 40s, like the amount of performance that's potentially being left on the table. I mean, obviously there's more important things at play than just how fast someone can run a marathon or whatever. There's obviously more life and death situations, but I try to stress to people, like, you know, if you're, if you're an athlete and you want optimal performance, like you can make the argument all day long that it helps you relax, it helps you sleep, it helps you wind down. No. But you know, the, the evidence is very clear on slow wave sleep and, and how it impacts that, which we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. But it, it's what I'm hearing is that it, it just validates what I've felt from a metabolic side in the body. I mean, like it just doesn't make sense. Like it, it feels like everything preferentially has to take a back seat to what the liver can deal with because the liver has to deal with that acetaldehyde. So everything else just kind of, hey, you got to go in the back burner here for a minute while we deal with this. Justin doesn't realize just how close he has become to losing everything. This is it. This is the last resort. Alcohol's effects on the brain are quite complex. So just about any substance that people experience some kind of pleasure from tend to affect the brain centers that are involved in reward and control. And, and then over time with the addiction, the brain that, uh, that, that external stimulant there, and what ends up happening is some of those dopamine receptors kind of get used to having that and they end up either becoming less sensitive or less productive of dopamine so that when you stop, your brain's not really ready for that. When someone is alcohol dependent, it is one of the most destructive drugs to various parts of your, of your body and different organ systems. From the top down, a chronic alcohol dependence can have significant effects on cognitive functioning, memory, motor coordination, all which is controlled up in the brain. And you can have esophageal problems down into the stomach, pancreas, the liver, because the liver is the organ that kind of clears a lot of the toxic things out of our body. When that starts shutting down, it not only is not able to really process alcohol and its toxic byproducts well, but there are other things that it just starts it starts losing functioning. Do you have a high level of stress in your life? We right. just talked about why stress is absolutely intrinsically linked to your relationship with alcohol. It's the most well used, known, available, readily available tool for dealing with stress, but it also creates stress. Alcohol releases significant amounts of cortisol. In fact, they recently found regular alcohol consumption over time increases the production of cortisol. Okay, so you're not only releasing cortisol in the moment, but you're producing more cortisol over time. Now, cortisol sends you into fight or flight. If I don't have my, like if I don't have alcohol, I become extremely irritable and nothing you say to me is gonna make sense. I'm too wound up about where the hell my next buzz is gonna come from. You tell me that ain't some twisted political everybody's Alcohol is an extraordinarily pernicious drug, and yeah. if you're inclined towards it, you can be inclined towards it because you're sensitive to its anxiety-reducing properties, or you can be sensitive to it because it enhances social communication, or because it produces a psychomotor high like cocaine, or all of those at yeah. once. And if you're particularly predisposed to alcoholism, you can experience all three at once. Chronic drinking doesn't necessarily mean every day and every night. It could be the person that simply drinks every Thursday or every Friday or just once a week has three or four drinks or maybe even a few more. That person is going to experience a decrease in this top-down inhibition, so an increase in impulsivity and habitual behavior because the break on those behaviors has been removed while they're drinking, but also changes in the very neural circuits that allow habitual and impulsive behavior to occur more readily even when they're not drinking. I love you and I don't want to lose you. And I'm here to help you see your potential as a husband, a father, and a friend. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to reach your goals as a songwriter and a musician. And I'm here because I couldn't think of any other way to help you get back home to your family. The loss of your presence at home is felt on a daily basis. And this makes me feel lost because I didn't marry you to become a single parent. 
I'm asking you if you'll please get help today. <laughs> you want an answer? I'm not going to treatment now. I'm begging you to please get help today. I'm not interested. I ain't going nowhere. Rehabs. All right, so tell them if the answer's no. The answer's no. Of course the answer's no. I ain't going. It ain't happening. No. You, 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 call y'all. Appreciate you. Good. Thank you. Thanks for dragging me through all this and lying to me this whole time. Every single one of y'all. Whatever you're doing right now has all sorts of risks. You're just, you're just blind to them because you've habituated to them. They've become invisible. You can't wait around to make things better on the assumption that what you're doing already is without risk. Don't hit anything harder than it needs to be hit. That's a good rule of thumb. I realized that the only thing I bonded with some people over was that we both ended up getting drunk in the same places each week. But beyond that, I didn't really have anything in common with them. Some friends started to drift away, which was fine. But I realized that if they were genuine friends, they'd support me in the path to bettering myself. And if friends only wanted to be around me when I was destroying myself along with them, then maybe I needed better friends. Remember, there are people who have genetic variants that meaning genes that they inherited from their parents that make it more likely that they will become alcoholics. If people are ingesting alcohol, even if it's not every night, there are well-recognized changes in neural circuits. There are well-recognized changes in neurochemistry within the brain. And there are well-recognized changes in the brain to body stress system. Increased stress when people are not drinking, diminished mood and feelings of well-being when people are not drinking. And as you'll soon learn, changes in the neural circuitry cause people to want to drink even more in order to get just back to baseline or the place that they were in terms of their stress modulation and in terms of their feelings of mood before they ever started drinking in the first place. Those sorts of drinking patterns are changing neural circuitry and they're changing hormone circuitry. They're actually changing them for the worse. And worse is defined as making people less resilient to stress, higher levels of baseline stress and lower mood overall. Stop. Oh, no. We're doing this for you. Bryson, stop. wait. Stop and listen to me, please. You get hands off me. Oh, please stop. Please. Okay. No, you don't. Oh, y'all. I'll see you more. Such a pay for it. Just listen. No, I'll follow. It's for us. I'm coming through the grip. Remember, this is just ready to go. It's ready to go. They lost him. Here's something most people don't know about marijuana. Officially, the US federal government classifies it as a Schedule I drug. That is the strictest classification they have, period, full stop. That means the government thinks marijuana is more dangerous than Schedule II drugs like cocaine or meth. It means they think marijuana is on the same plane as heroin. You know how many people died directly from overdosing on marijuana? Zero. And I don't mean zero in 2010. I mean zero in basically recorded human history. There is one drug you won't see on there, even though it is a hell of a lot more dangerous than pot or even cocaine. That's alcohol. The thing about alcohol is it's really bad for you, lethally bad for you. I don't want to be a hypocrite here. I enjoy a drink. But the evidence on this, you cannot run away from. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say there are 88,000 deaths each year attributable to alcohol. But nonetheless, when you ingest ethanol, NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells. It's discriminant as to which cells it damages and kills. Call's pretty good. Yeah. So you better find something a lot yeah. better, man. <laughs> yeah. And then it is. And then esteemable people do esteemable things. It's like, yeah, well, you want to figure out, you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up. Why yeah. do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, so why stop? Well, you do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself. You, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah, well, it is, but you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like, that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do Yeah. And, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. 
Actually, the addiction is the substitute for that, if, if truth be known. People who drink regularly, so this again could be just one or two drinks per night, or it could be somebody that drinks just on Fridays or just on Saturdays, or maybe just on the weekend, two to four drinks. Well, those people experience changes in their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that result in more cortisol, more of this so-called stress hormone being released at baseline when they are not drinking. This is really important. People who drink a bit, and when I say a bit, I don't mean one or two sips or even a glass of wine every once in a while. I mean, again, people that are maybe having one drink a night with dinner and maybe on the weekend a few more. Again, I offer a bunch of different patterns to explain how it could also be two or three drinks on Friday or six drinks only on Saturday. Well, all of those groups experience increases in cortisol release from their adrenal glands when they are not drinking. And as a consequence, they feel more stressed and more anxiety when they aren't drinking. This is a seldom talked about effect of alcohol because so often we hear about the immediate effects of alcohol, right? And we've been talking about some of those effects. Effects like reducing the amount of stress. I mean, how many times have we heard somebody say, oh, I need a drink, and then they have a drink, and they're like, calm down. Now they can shake off the thoughts about the day's work. They can start to think about things in a maybe more grounded or rational way, or at least they believe that, or they can somehow just relax themselves. Well, while that very well may be true, that it can relax them, when they are not drinking, that level of cortisol that's released at baseline has increased substantially. Again, this relates to a defined neural circuit between brain and body, and it has a deal of cortisol to some of the other hormones involved in the stress response. Sometimes some habits can turn into lifestyles, and certain lifestyles don't lead to all the benefits and all the amazing things that life has to offer. Some lifestyles lead to very dark paths, a depression, uh, anxiety, stress, um, and if not controlled, can also lead to some of the worst case scenarios out there in life. One of them being never reaching your capacity, never really having an identity or a self-worth, losing all integrity, all dignity, and losing yourself. Just a few years ago, I was in a very dark place in my life. They say that depression comes from the inability to construct the future in your mind. I couldn't see the future. I didn't know who I was supposed to be. I was wanting to be a certain person, but making all the wrong decisions. I made a lot of mistakes. When it comes to alcohol itself, which is something that I was struggling with at the time, it went slowly from being a work hard, play hard, have a drink, to two drinks, to three drinks, to then a habit, to then a daily habit, to then a 24 seven habit, to then a every weekend habit, getting lost in myself habit. Sometimes if you don't watch the kind of habits that you're building, they become lifestyles. Before I knew it, I was digging myself a hole and everywhere I looked, it was so dark and I lost myself. I spiraled into a sense of no self-worth and I struggled a lot and nobody knew. I hit rock bottom to the point where I almost lost my job, to the point where some people had to have very tough conversations with me. Some friends had to deal with my drama and they say hurting people hurt people. I was hurting inside and I was hurting others and didn't even know it. The person who is drinking two or three times a week will have less blood flow in their brain. And will that have changed the shape of their brain? Yes, it'll be a little bit more shriveled. And then that means their behavior is going to change as well. They'll have a little bit less impulse control. And when you look at the brain of and an a little bit less impulse control when you're doing hard things like marriage, <laughs> not a good thing or raising children or managing a business. It's like, you don't want a little bit worse decision. People convince themselves, right? Right now we're in dry January. They're like, okay, I do dry January every year, therefore I don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. But I also drink three bottles of wine every day at lunch. Now I know a guy who said that to me, right? Yeah. You know, he drinks three bottles of wine at lunch every day, probably finishes off with all sorts of whiskey at And because later. he can do dry January, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Yeah because he has proved to himself that he can quit and put it down when he yeah. wants to. Uh, never mind, you know, the, the, the white knuckling and whatever. All kind of, of those things. Yeah, the delusion. Like, went into, you know, just making it to day 30 so he could yeah. continue to yeah. perpetuate that argument as a form of denial. But yeah. Millions and holds. millions of people, Rich. Millions and this millions is why, of people. This is why, you know, people who come into 
Alcoholics Anonymous or, or 12 step programs will, once they, you know, kind of get well or better, will identify as a grateful alcoholic or addict mm -hmm. because the pain was so severe and the habit was so pronounced, they were forced to reckon with it and, you know, break up with that lover. Yeah. And as a result, have been blessed with tools and this brand new life that has created something wonderful out of, you know, this, this disease. Mm. Um, but for the person who's a heavy user or drinker who can continue along that path without wreaking inadequate amount of havoc in their life, where they have to confront or, 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 you know, deal with the fact that they might have a problem, they're stuck in a cycle that is harder to break because there aren't circumstances you can point to, to say, it's time, you gotta give it up. Yeah. And they live their lives, you know, most of them live the rest of their lives in this suboptimal state where they're really not living the life that is freely available to them otherwise. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think if we can direct the conversation to where people are looking, where if, if they're not looking to stop drinking, then where are they looking? Alcoholism wants you alone, it wants you sick, and then it wants to kill you. And it took over decades of my life, and I pray to you, if you worry that you're having this problem, or you know somebody that is, raise your hand, find somebody who's smarter than you about this, and talk to them, and be honest about it, because the secrets are what kill us. You know, the thing that always makes me cry, and I hope I, I, hope I don't cry here, is that it's not fair. It's not, it's not fair. That I had to go through this disease while the other five didn't. They got everything that I, that I got. But I, I had to fight this thing, and still have to fight this thing. So just to end this on a good note, there are people that will help you and get their help. It doesn't go away. It never goes away.